When a Catholic woman philosopher enters into the discussion of abortion, she enters with a variety of tools and experience that provide the perspective for her examination. She enters with the tools of her disciplines, philosophy and science, and she, because she is Catholic, has been formed by the stories of the scriptures, the Annunciation, the Visitation, two women, each with a problem pregnancy, the joy of the nativity, and she is informed by scriptural themes, including that of the love of the least of these. When, in addition, she is a mother, she enters the discussion of abortion with the memory of her own experiences and awarenesses of nascent human life developing within her body. These are important experiences which enrich her perspective and which she ought not to cast aside. The question of abortion continues in the contemporary culture to be an emotion-filled issue. The public debate appears to be centered on the reasons why and the justification for the abortion. The focus has been so powerful that the objective pole of the act, that is the reality of what is done when an abortion is performed or procured, has been largely obscured. As a consequence, the public debate has been seriously skewed. The philosophical debate centers on the ontological status of the conceived but not yet born human being, the conceptus. What I would like to do in the next two lectures is first, offer some observations, second, present some historically interesting information, third, delineate the outline of the contemporary debate, fourth, formulate an ordered position, and fifth, from within that position, respond to opposing positions. First, the observations. The first observation is that there is a certain simplicity about the issue of abortion. If abortion takes the life of, an, of a human being, then abortion is a species of the moral problem of killing human beings, a kind of homicide. And the ethical injunctions that apply to other kinds of killing of human beings apply similarly to abortion. If, on the other hand, abortion is an act that destroys a life that is not a human life, then abortion is not the same as other acts of killing human beings, and the ethical injunctions regarding abortion are to be attenuated according to those circumstances. So a central issue here is what is the object of abortion. The second observation is that conclusions that are reached in regard to abortion have implications for other significant issues in medical ethics. Included among them are cloning, the use of stem cells, genetic testing and screening, and assisted reproduction. Now a bit of history. Abortion as a means of birth control is as old as the human race. There are other practices though, such as stealing, murder, and rape, which are also as old as the human race, and society rightly condemns these actions. The longevity of the practice of abortion is no more testimony to its moral acceptability than the fact that the presence of practices such as stealing, murder, and rape would require us to accept them. Now throughout much of history, there has been little regard for nascent human life, mainly because it remained unhidden. It remained hidden. Nonetheless, there are some early instances of the condemnation of abortion. The Oath of Hippocrates, which called the Guild of Ancient Physicians to practice their art within a set of specific ethical constraints, contains this pledge. I will not give a woman a pessary to cause abortion. While the meaning and the extent of application of that swearing has been subjected to interpretation in the contemporary world, nonetheless, its appearance in antiquity suggests at least that those most closely associated with the practice of medicine condemned the practice of abortion. On the other hand, some philosophers, including Plato, in the pursuit of his ideal republic, encouraged or permitted abortion for pregnancy out of season 
and infanticide for unwanted and imperfect children. Plato admonished the citizens of the Republic that it was, and I quote, preferable not even to bring to light anything whatever thus conceived, but if they were unable to prevent birth or dispose of it on the understanding that we cannot, we cannot rear such offspring, end of quote. Recall that for Plato, the more important good is the good of the polis. The individual is subsumed in that larger good. In a more limited sense, Aristotle, in his politics, permitted abortion, provided that it be done before life begins. Aristotle wrote, and I quote, when couples have children in excess, let abortion be procured before life and sense have begun. What may or may not be done lawfully in these cases depends upon the question of life and sensation, end of quote. Note Aristotle's careful caveat, before life and sensation. While the scriptures of the Old Testament record nothing about abortion in the modern medical sense as an elective medical intervention, they do testify to a profound regard for, for the human being developing in the womb of the woman. The prophet Jeremiah records God's love for the unborn in these words, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. The psalmist acknowledges the careful creation and intimate love of God for God's creatures in these words, you formed my innermost being, you knit me in my mother's womb, my very self you knew, my bones were not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, fashioned in the depths of the earth. There is in Exodus 21:22 a passage that refers to the accidental injury to a pregnant woman and the possible occurrence of miscarriage as a consequence of the injury. In the Hebrew translation, it is said that if the woman is injured, the person who caused the injury suffers a punishment commensurate to the woman's injury, that is, life for life, eye for eye. If the woman is uninjured, but the child is lost, a penalty is to be set by the husband of the woman. However, the Greek translation of the same passage prescribes the penalty of life for life for the death of the child if the child is formed. In the early Christian tradition, abortion is condemned as early as the Didache in the first century. The Didache, or the teaching of the 12 apostles, is an ancient statement of Christian principles found in Syria. Among its proscriptions are, you are not to slay the child by abortion. You shall not kill what is generated. For some of the early philosophers and some of the early theologians, the question of the determination of the humanity of, the, of an entity was answered in terms of its soul. The suke was the source of the activities. That is, the soul is the principle of its life. Insolment was not a narrow theological question. It was an account of the internal source of the variety of activities manifested in the life of the entity. The move was from activities to, in, to intrinsic principle of those activities. Nutritive activities such as living, growing, and developing offered evidence of the presence of a vegetative soul. The activity of motion suggested the presence of a sentient soul, which higher level soul subsumed the lower level activities. Rational activities indicated the presence of a rational soul, a soul that has the capacity to think, to understand, to reason, to choose, and to decide. The rational soul, as a higher level soul, subsumes the vegetative and sentient activities. In the contemporary world, the abortion debate is embedded in a matrix which is defined by limits which range from the most subjective claims to the barest objective claims. Among these elements on the subjective side are the following. There is the claim of the right of women to abortion as the necessity of absolute control over reproductive processes in order that women be free to develop their potential. Some social planners have offered abortion as an aid to families in circumstances of social and or economic distress, 
and others have offered abortion as a humane solution to problems of deformed, battered, and retarded children. On a global level, abortion has been suggested as a significant contribution to the solution of population problems. In addition, the contemporary culture is filled with a particular kind of liberalism which canonizes autonomy and makes personal choice the essential criterion for the determination of the rightness of an action. Because the objective question must be answered first in order to weigh the adequacy of the subjective determinants, it is appropriate to start here with the objective question. The empirical sciences, especially embryology and fetology, are the sources of the empirical facts describing the developmental stages of human life. The pertinent information from these sciences is that regarding neither the cosmological origin of life nor even the phylogenetic origin of life. It is information regarding the ontogenetic beginning and unfolding of an individual human life from its beginning. These sciences offer the information that the occurrence that marks the beginning of the process that is the life and development of the individual human being is syngamy. Syngamy is the end point in the process of fertilization, a process which begins when the ovum carrying in its pronucleus the species kind and half the species number of chromosomes is penetrated by the sperm which contains in its pronucleus a similar complement. The chromosomes born by each pronucleus conjugate along the mitotic spindle supplied by the sperm. And with the pa their pairing, the full species number of chromosomes is reestablished. With the completion of this pairing, a new level of metabolic activity begins in this now single cell zygote. This new level of activity is not limited to nuclear activity. For example, the gravitation of the cytoplasm, a maternal contribution, establishes a polarity for the new being, most likely in the direction followed by the penetration by the sperm. The activity of the new being is directed toward its survival. It generates barriers to its being penetrated by additional sperm. It generates barriers which prevents its implantation in an inappropriate environment. And when it arrives in a suitable environment, it generates those structures to nurture and support its continued existence and growth. The occurrence of syngamy marks a locus of simultaneous convergence and divergence. The convergence is the coming together of the genetic donation of both parents and that of their ancestors. Here, the continuity of human life is maintained. The divergence is not simply the, the discontinuity between parent and offspring because of genetic uniqueness, but also discontinuity because of inner unity and separateness from others of this de novo being. Once the zygote is constituted in the fusion of the chromosomal material, there is a new individual. Hence, syngamy has been designated the ontogenetic zero point of development. The ontogenetic zero point of, de of development for an individual human life is, de is defined as that point on the continuum of development that marks the beginning of the development of this new individual. The ontogenetic zero point of behavior requires significant neural and muscular development. With the commencement of neuromuscular activity, behavior, behavior follows. This beginning of behavior is dependent upon prior structural growth, which is genetically determined. The structural growth is such that it may be, may be said to anticipate and to determine subsequent behavioral expression. Behavior matures in a direction following organ maturation and behavior functions to reinforce and refine organic capacities. This is Carmichael's law of anticipatory function. Development is continuous and is organized in a specific and forward direction. 
while various stages of development are named for reference and for convenience, the determination of stages is purely arbitrary, and one stage merges into another without any point of demarcation. The following is a summary of the biological process. Morphological growth and subsequent behavioral development are products of genetic encoding at work in an environment which is normal for the species of the organism. Self-generating developmental stages succeed one another in a genetically determined manner. The phenotype, apparitional characteristics of the individual, which was identical to the genotype, assemblage of genes at syngamy, now emerges as the expression of the particularities of the genetic constitution in the presence of a continuously changing environment. From syngamy until death, the genetic code continues to influence and to determine growth and behavior, provided the presence of suitable environment and the achievement of proper stages of development. The present reality of the human being from its onto ontogenetic zero point of development onward, that is from zygote to pre-implantation embryo, to embryo, to fetus, to neonate, to child, to adolescent, to adult, is an upward directive dynamism toward ever fuller realization of being until the onset of decline, senescence, and death. Each lower stage lays down the conditions for the emergence of the next higher stage. The self-actualization of the individual human being is not limited to biological determinations. The life of the individual is a process that presses toward actualization of psychological and intellectual potentialities that are inherent in the constitution of the individual human being. Abraham Maslow, the renowned psychologist, described this process of self-actualization in the following, and I quote, man is ultimately not molded or shaped into humanness or taught to be human. The role of the environment is ultimately to permit him or to help him actualize his own potentialities, not its potentialities. The environment does not give him his potentialities. He has them in inchoate or embryonic form, just exactly as he has embryonic arms and legs. And creativeness, spontaneity, selfhood, authenticity, caring for others, being able to love, yearning for truth, are embryonic potentialities belonging to his species membership, just as much as are his arms, legs, brain, and eyes." End of quote. Maslow is making at least two important points here. One of these is that what a human being is, as constituted in his nature, determines what a human being becomes. The second is that neither culture, nor history, nor socialization creates human beings. Environmental factors, including psychological and biological, may inhibit or encourage the actualization of psychological potentialities. The existential reality of the being at its earliest stage of development is that of a being in whom the perfections, whether body or behavior or psychological, exist in an unachieved state of affairs. The existential reality of the adult human being is that of a being in whom some of the perfections exist in a relatively more or less achieved state of affairs. The possibility of self-actualization requires the continuous existence of a being with the capacity for these perfections and the existence of that human being in its normal environment. Since much of the philosophical discussion about the ontological status of the conceptus has centered on the notion of its potentiality, this issue will be addressed next. The rich philosophical notions of act and potency carry distinct distinctions adequate for describing the developing life of the human being. The description of the present reality of any developmental stage in the life of an individual human being must convey the fact neither of absolutely nothingness nor of completed being. The conceptus exists as a present reality. It is in act, the, with potentialities directed toward a particular perfection, the goal established by the genotype. 
the conceptus is a human being in act. Within that being resides the active natural potentiality to, beco to become a more fully developed human being. Explication of this complex issue of potentiality requires attendance to notions of potentiality that are active and passive, those that are natural and specific, and those that are remote and proximate. In active potency, the being goes from not acting to acting and is also the agent of the acting. For example, the human being may develop or move by its own intrinsic agency from being not conscious to being conscious. In passive potency, a human being has the capacity to receive a modification, but the agency of the modification is an external agent. For example, a potential president may become an actual president by the agency of voters. The president receives the office, a passive reception, from an, an extrinsic agency, the voters. The present reality of the conceptus in relationship to the adult human being is not that of a passive potentiality, which, ex which requires extrinsic agency for actualization. In the act that is the conceptus, there, re there resides the active potentiality to become a more fully developed human being. There are two distinct factors that make up the notion of active potentiality. One is constitution and the other is tendency. Constitution is the underlying manifold which determines the direction of the tendency. It is that which the tendency by its dis dispositive thrust urges to completion. Tendency is the drive to action. The conceptus is, by its constitution, determined as a human being, and is, by tendency, determined to become in a fashion prefixed by the constitution rather than not. Since the tendency of the conceptus in regard to fuller human development proceeds in a completely determined manner, and since it cannot be something other than what the Constitution determines it to be, and since it cannot of itself not become, it may be said that the potentiality of the fetus or conceptus for more fully developed human life is an active potentiality. Active potentialities are designated either natural or specific. In the accomplishment of an act of specific potentiality, the agent has a degree of freedom in the actualization of the potentiality. We may, for example, choose the kind of food to nourish our potentiality to continue in existence. The agent may specify the manner then to actualize that potentiality. Active natural potentialities, on the other hand, are completed in a, in a determined manner. The agent is not free to choose whether or not to actualize the potency. Tendency determines that the potentiality will be actualized. In addition, the agent is not free to specify, to specify the manner in which to actualize the potentiality. For the actualization of an act of natural potentiality, nothing is needed on the side of the agent beyond its constitution and the tendency to realize that constitution. Factors external to the agent may bring, bring about its destruction and hence inhibit the actualization, but the agent itself cannot inhibit the actualization. A further distinction must be made between those potentialities which may be designated remote and those which are designated proximate. This designation is a function of time and development. The presence of the proximate potentiality allows for immediate realization. The presence of a remote potentiality allows the possibility of future activity and future realization. However, the remote precedes the proximate and is the necessary condition for the existence of the proximate, both in terms of constitution and tendencies. The proximate is the further developmental specification of the, of the remote. In regard to specific functions, characteristics of more developmental stages there exist in the conceptus the remote potentialities which specify the proximate potentialities which proximate potentialities are necessary for action. For example, in the chromosomal material, in a relatively unachieved state of affairs, 
There is all that is necessary for the becoming of the neocortex, which serves as the proximate potency for the higher thought processes. In summary then, the existential reality of the conceptus is that of a human being in act. It expresses that being as a unified whole, unified in itself and, distingu and distinguished from others. It is living, as indicated by its growth, and by its ability to utilize materials from its environment to sustain its existence. Its individuality and its uniqueness derive from its genetic constitution. It is human, and in it reside not only the biological potentialities, but all the potentialities that are distinctive of human existence. It may be said that the complexity of the whole human body is contained in some real way in the first self, in the first cell. From the facts of the biological and psychological development and from the translation of those facts into metaphysical terms, a minimal notion of the life of the human being emerges. A human being is an open, unfinished being who begins existence at syngamy, the ontogenetic zero point of development, and who becomes what it is by developing its potentialities. This becoming, which is described in various stages, is a time condition unfolding of the potentialities given at fertilization. The existential reality at each stage of development is different only in degree of actualization. What exists in the more fully developed human being in a relatively achieved state of affairs ex existed in the zygote in a relatively unachieved state of affairs. The adult human being cannot be more than the reality contained in the zygote. The existential reality of the adult is that of a being who is in action the fulfillment of the existential reality of the zygote. The zygote is a living human being at a particular stage in its development. It is what the human being ought to be at that stage of development. The embryo is a living human being. It is what a human being ought to be at that age. And so it is the same individual who develops organically, psychically, and intellectually. If this is so, then abortion destroys a developing human being. Hence, abortion is a kind of homicide. <laughs>